Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. Today we're going to be assessing some teaching of Peter Haas, the senior pastor of Substance Church in Minnesota. Our format is pretty consistent here on the channel. We simply listen to clips of people teaching and we compare what they are saying to the Word of God. And it's pretty simple. If what they are saying is true, we should listen to it. And if it isn't, then maybe that tells us this is not somebody we should be listening to as we follow Christ. But before we get to our assessment, if you want to help point people to the true Christian message and get this out to more people here on YouTube, please go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel and thank you in advance. All right, with that, we're ready to get to our assessment. Let's jump into our first clip. I'm just saying all of us longs to look good, but life conspires against us. And I, I think personally, I, I you know, I, I think personally that's why we are obsessed with like superheroes. Why do people keep going to superhero movies? What is it about superheroes? Well, I think all of us loves the idea that somehow there's somebody that can transcend the normal reality. You know what I'm saying? I think all of us has a secret desire that maybe someday we could fly or shoot laser beams out of our eyes. I don't know what your thing is, but all of us are gonna experience the limitation in life and we're gonna want more. Guess what? God actually put that in your heart. God put it in all of our hearts. There is more, I think deep in our hearts. We know there is more to life than what we are currently experiencing. God put the desire in us for a transcendent life which is why we're kind of obsessed with things like this. In fact, God, God put that in us that we might seek him, okay? All right, so in that clip, Peter was talking about people's desire for greatness and how they want to be a superhero. And he said that God is the one who put that desire within people, and he claims that God did so so that people would seek after him. Friends, are you going to find any passage of scripture that says that God put a desire to be great within you and that when you recognize that desire to be great, that you will turn to him, I guess, so that you can reach the fullness of your greatness or something to that extent? No, I don't think you're going to find that in the Bible at all. And this is pretty twisted because it really makes it seem like someone's motivation to come and follow Jesus, to come to faith in Christ, is that they are missing out on greatness, and God wants to make them a, a quote-unquote superhero. And friends, that is not what we see put forth in Scripture at all. In, in fact, just a couple of verses that I want to point you to. Number one is Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So you're not supposed to, to think super highly of yourself, but you're also not supposed to be doing things from selfish ambition or conceit. You're not supposed to be so consumed with how you can achieve these levels of temporal greatness in your life. I also think about the verse that says to not think more highly of yourself than you ought. And yet Peter Haas is saying God put that desire in in you, and that would be the motivation for you to want to have this relationship with God. I, I want to turn just to one more passage of Scripture. I'm not going to say this one is completely apples to apples here, but this uh, teaching that Peter Haas is giving, it at least reminds me of the story of Simon the Sorcerer, where Simon wasn't really interested in following Jesus because he was a sinner in need of forgiveness, which is what we all are. That should be the motivation to seek after God. You recognize your own sinfulness and you recognize that you need to look outside of yourself for saving and you have to look to Jesus. Well, Simon didn't understand that. He just wanted the things that God could do for him. In fact, he wanted to be someone great and he is rebuked sharply for it. So we're in the book of Acts chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 18 to 23. It says, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness 
and in the bond of iniquity. So when Simon is not as concerned with getting God as much as he is with getting the things that God can do so that he would have this great power that he can use to puff himself up, boy, he is rebuked sharply. And so I have a big concern. Again, I, I said it's not completely apples to apples, but it's at least in the same ballpark. I think when Peter Haas is talking about, you know, you have greatness inside of you. You, you, you desire to be great. You desire to be a superhero. God put that desire and come to you. He'll help you achieve those things. Friends, this is not a biblical message. All right, that's it for our first clip. Let's go ahead and jump to our second one. Okay, and let me, let me show this to you in the Bible, okay? Check this out. Jesus was actually telling his disciples about these types of things, and he's actually saying the good news is this, is that God wants to give you supernatural ability. And then he gives them a promise that is absolutely intense. Out of John 14, 12 through 14, Jesus, again, Jesus is saying, hey, my time on planet Earth is very short, so, uh, but the, here's the good news. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do, get this, wow. They will do even greater things than these because I am going to my Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, time out, Jesus. Because, I mean, did G I mean, Jesus did a lot of crazy things. He raised people from the dead. He healed the blind. He cast out demons. I mean, he did a lot of things. I mean, you can't even go barely a chapter or two throughout the Gospels where Jesus was not doing something crazy, miraculous. And, and yet, Get this, he literally says that his true followers are gonna do even greater things than these. Why? Because I'm going to my father, okay? Greater miracles. I mean, I'm just saying that's pretty intense that his followers are gonna be doing greater things than him. All right, I'm really happy to assess that teaching. It's a passage of scripture I've been wanting to cover for a while, and it is one that you will see many people improperly handle, and I think we just saw Peter Haas did that as well. So let's look at John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 12 through 14, and then we'll try to get the understanding of what Jesus was trying to communicate here. So starting in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And so I want to start with what the correct understanding is. When Jesus says, I mean, I want you to know that I'm not saying like, oh, no, no, this isn't in the Bible. No, I just think there's a different understanding than what Peter Haas is saying. When Jesus says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, he's speaking in a plural sense. So he's speaking to the body of Christ. And he is saying, the body of Christ, my people, uh, my saints, right, his chosen ones, will do greater works than him in the sense of the scope not in sense of the quality. We are not doing greater miracles than Christ in terms of quality, but we are doing more things than he did. And by the way, when he says that he'll do the works, greater works, um, that word works is more than just signs and miracles. It really has to do with anything, good deeds, his preaching, right? And so uh, Jesus, during his earthly ministry, because uh, he limited himself to a physical body, right? God became man. He took on a physical body. Well, he was limited in that sense in terms of how far he could go with his preaching. He could not to be everywhere at once. But we, as his people, are responsible for taking the Gospels to the ends of the earth. We are able to serve more people than Jesus did collectively as his body. And so it is in that sense that we can do greater works than him. So that is a correct understanding of that passage of Scripture. And just to point out, in case you disagree with me and you believe Peter Haas, then the question would certainly have to be asked. No, if we are going to do greater miracles than Jesus in a qualitative sense, then how come we aren't seeing that take place? And in fact, Peter Haas addressed that, and that's where we're going to pick up, right where we left off in his sermon, because he is going to acknowledge the fact that people might say, 
how come we aren't seeing people do greater works than Jesus? You know, Jesus did some pretty intense things. He mentioned some of them. I mean, he he raised the dead. He walked on water. He multiplied food and he, he turned water into wine. I mean, he, he did all sorts of stuff. How come we aren't seeing people do greater work? So he's going to give his explanation. We'll listen to it and then we'll come back and we'll assess it and compare what he is saying to the Bible. So then it begs the question, well, then why are we not? Well, some people are, right? But there's what, why, why is Christianity not associated with miracles? Well, the Apostle Paul actually explained this, that in the last days, okay, before Jesus returns, in the last days, Christianity is going to go through a shift. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. And then, and then here's the twist having a form of godliness, but denying its power. In other words, there's gonna be forms of Christianity where it is a ritual, it is an ideology, but it is no longer a supernatural invasion of spiritual power. It's gonna be something different. People will have a form of it, but not the actual power. And, and that's gonna be a sign that it is the last days. All right, so as I said, Peter Haas started by acknowledging the fact that somebody would say, well, hey, how come we're not seeing this sort of power? How come we're not seeing these sorts of miracles? And he actually started, his first comment was, well, some people are. Friends, I want you to think about that. Think about, again, what Jesus did. Jesus walked on water. Jesus turned the water into wine. Jesus was consistently casting demons out of people, healing people. Um, Jesus brought people back from the dead. I mean, are you around people who are consistently doing that at the level that Jesus was doing things? I mean, Jesus was making people with shriveled hands. Their hands were growing out. I mean, are you seeing people who are doing that? So Peter Haas, when he says some people are, I would venture to say that nobody is, that he cannot provide proof of anybody who is doing that sort of thing. So I, I don't think he's correct in saying that. But I also want to show that when he tries to go to more scripture to back up his point, I would say, again, he's not correctly handling God's word. And we need to point that out, friends. Just because someone points out a, a passage of scripture to you, it does not mean that they are rightly explaining the meaning of that passage. Every author, every writer of scripture was inspired by God, and there is a real meaning that is meant to be conveyed to each of us. So we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. And remember, he was saying that this was really about there being a time when people were going to have some sort of religious exterior, but they are going to deny uh, the power of godliness because they, they have no power, right? Like they're not acting. And remember, when he talks about power, he said we're supposed to be doing greater works than Christ. So I guess to deny it would be you're not walking in greater miracles than Jesus did. But let's read this passage. Pay attention if there's much talk about power in here. See what the main theme of these verses, uh, what it is. And, and I think you'll get a sense for maybe what verse 5 means. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. So what is the main part of that section about? It is just talking about the ungodliness that people are going to be living with, right? We go through that very long list of the way that people are going to be behaving. And and you see that when we get down to verse 5, it is a continuation. There is a comma. It's a continuation of the previous thought. So at the end of verse 4, it says, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, continuing that same thought, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And so think about this, friend. So when it says, but denying its power, what is its? It's godliness. Right, So for you to have the appearance of godliness but to deny its power means you're trying to put off an impression to everybody else that you're really godly in your behavior, but ultimately you're ungodly. Why? Because you're a lover of self, a lover of money, proud, arrogant, abusive. You're all of those things. Think about the Pharisees, right? Outwardly to many people, they would have appeared very godly, but when Jesus rebuked them, he didn't say, you people are so godly, but you have these other problems. No, he's like, you're hypocrites, right? You, you're, you're nasty. You don't keep the law. You actually break the law. 
Paul. And so having the appearance of godliness but denying its power would better be explained as somebody, uh, an example of it would be like somebody who goes to church and around their friends, they, they try to pretend like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm a good Christian. But then they go out and they live a completely carnal, sinful uh, lifestyle. That person has the appearance of godliness but denies the power of godliness, denies the power of true godliness is going to demonstrate itself with your behavior. So when he tries to make this all about walking in miracles, he's not even understanding what this passage of scripture is about. And I would like to point out at this point, right? So Peter Haas's own theology, he thinks that if you don't have the power, if you're not walking in greater power, greater miracles than Jesus, then there's something wrong. Then you're, you're denying the, the, uh, the godliness. You're denying its power. Friends, do you think Peter Haas has greater miracles than Jesus? He doesn't. So by his own theology, he's in big trouble. And this is my concern. Friends, this is not a matter, if you're listening to me, by the way, this is not a matter of can God do miracles today? Yes, God can do miracles. And God can do miracles through people when they pray or when they do something. God can absolutely work. So I don't want you to think that I'm sitting here and saying God doesn't do miracles. God has no power today. God has all power. God can do miracles whatever he wants. But I want you to have a right understanding of the fact that you are not supposed to be, nor should you expect that you're going to be doing greater things than Jesus did by yourself in your life. If you think that you're supposed to be, you are just going to be run down. You're going to be discouraged because that is not going to be your reality because it's not going to be anybody's reality. And so I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to start to question your faith. And I think this is oftentimes what happens is people don't have that experience. They're not seeing miracles left and right. They're not raising people from the dead. They're not walking on water. And so then they start to say, well, I don't know, maybe this whole message that's being taught to me, maybe it's just not even real. And they turn away from their faith. So I would rather you just have a correct understanding of God's word that you can believe that miracles do take place. You can believe that God has power, but you would also understand that he is sovereign and he will do those things as he will. And he might work through you, but he may not. But you should not expect that you are going to be living a life that is on par with the God-man, Jesus Christ. Now, we strive to emulate him in terms of our godliness and our character, but we fall short of that. So we, we certainly turn to him for grace and for strength and for help to do those things. But yeah, certainly we don't expect to be having the same sort of miracles. And again, I think this really just turns people um, away from the faith as they get discouraged, but also even the people that he's calling to Christ, as I mentioned earlier, I don't necessarily think it's with uh, necessarily great intentions. Now, I'm not saying his intentions, but I don't think he's calling people for the right reasons is maybe a better way of saying it when he's saying, you want to be a superhero, come to Christ. That's not the true call of the gospel, right? When he's saying, um, you know, you can do greater miracles than Jesus did. Come to Christ. Like that's, that's not the Christian message, right? The Christian message is you are a sinner and so am I. We're all sinners and we're broken by sin and we all need a savior because we cannot do enough good things to make up for our sinfulness. We need a substitute. We need somebody who could live the perfect life that we cannot and have not lived. And that substitute is the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us. He was crucified and he resurrected from the dead three days later. We put our trust in him, him alone. So it should be about being saved from your sins, not about how you can be a superhero and go out and do great works. Friends, I have watched a decent amount of Peter Haas and his teachings. I have to say it's pretty consistent um, where he is just not correctly getting the, uh, the main gist when it comes to the Bible. I'm not going to say that everything he says is wrong, but he certainly says enough wrong that it's pretty alarming. And I think that we should uh, certainly stay away from his teaching. Um, just, just not listen to him, right? Friends, like you should want to listen to a Bible teacher who you are going to have great confidence. They are going to rightly explain God's word to you. And if you're not certain, even if somebody like, well, I think they get it right two thirds of the time. Why would you want them to get it right two thirds of the time? Friends, you can just find somebody who gets it right hundred percent of the time. Find that person and listen to that person instead. All right. I hope this is helpful to you in your walk with the Lord. If it is, if you will please consider subscribing to the channel and helping me to get this out to more people here on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for watching. And until next time, God bless.